So we're off to Pinewoods. So today we're going to talk about IAS um, and the different IAS standards that you are required to learn for AAT but hopefully in a nicer setting than just sitting at home so you might get to see a bit of woodland today. A um, bit of nature which is always good but um, as always let's get straight into the video. I've got to get out and get um, a ticket etc first so let's get on with it. Very windy. Look how nice and open this is. <laughs> Always a good place. We're trying to learn something quite technical like the IASR. Take yourself off somewhere nice like this and it'll help distress you. Do you know, even if you take away just one thing from today, winner winner, chicken dinner. So Let's talk about the different IAS that you need to be aware of when you're doing your AAT. So firstly, we have something called IAS-1, which is the conceptual framework around preparing a set of financial statements. Basically, IAS-1 goes into how you present your financial statements. And what it says is that you need to disclose in a set of accounts if you've applied something called an IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, or if you've applied IAS, which is the International Accounting Standard. International Financial Reporting Standards were actually issued by the International Financial Reporting Standards Board, hence why they're known as IFRS, whereas the International Accounting Standards were created by the International Accounting Standards Committee. So now it's moving on to IAS2. So IAS2 is the International Accounting Standard on Inventories. And what IAS2 basically says is that stock should be valued at the lower of cost and net realizable value. And what net realizable value is, is the amount that you think that you'd be able to sell that stock for. So it could be written down in a period or even potentially written up in some cases. Helicopter flying above. It's quite wet and windy but you wouldn't actually know that because the trees are covering a whole lot of the wind right now which is a good thing the wind is definitely picking up now so moving on to IAS 7 so IAS 7 basically lays out the guidance regarding cash flows so IAS 1 is the presentation of financial statements and is the main source for the required format of a set of financial statements whereas IAS 7 just gives you guidance regarding the statement of cash flows and how this needs to be laid out. Now IAS 8 is the accounting standard on accounting policies. These accounting policies are specific principles, bases and conventions. And these are applied by an entity when preparing their financial statements. So management have to select the appropriate accounting policies for their set of financial statements and that must comply with, with all international financial reporting standards and IAS. Look how nice that is over there. It's very windy though. Very, very windy. Next we have something that's called IAS 10, which is events after the reporting date. So this is an event that could be favourable or unfavourable that occurs between the end of the accounting period and the date that the, the accounts are authorised for signature. So there are two different types of events. Now one is an adjusting event and these require the, the financial statements to actually be adjusted to reflect their impact. And another one, a non-adjusting event, and these are merely noted in the financial statements. So next we have something that's called IAS 12 or income taxes and what that is is that companies need to pay tax on their profits in a year 
And basically, the amount of corporation tax that they actually have to pay is calculated using the tax rates provided by HMRC. Now, when you get to the exam itself, you'll probably be told the rate that you need to calculate corporation tax at, but you'll probably have to physically calculate the tax. Now, when you prepare your balance sheet or your statement of financial position, current tax for this period and tax that you've not yet paid are shown as liabilities. So they'll be sat under current liabilities in the statement of financial position. Now, one thing that you might find is that provision for a corporation tax payment is made in a set financial statement. So the liability is only an estimate. So the actual amount due will eventually be agreed with HMRC and any difference between what the liability is showing and what's actually due will have to be adjusted. So you might see that in an exam at some point or other where you need to adjust the liability that's currently sat on the balance sheet. Quite hilly this. Definitely not fit. <laughs> now IAS 17 covers leases. So leases can be categorised as either a finance lease or an operating lease. So I'd say of all of the IAS that you actually need to know, IAS 17 is probably one of the most complicated. That and provisions, contingencies, contingent assets and contingent liabilities. So a little tip, if I was going to do my revision now and I hadn't come across any of the IAS before today, I think I'd be leaving IAS 17 towards the last. Um, or if you think you're one of these individuals who likes to get a head start, then start with that one because there is a lot to take in. The height of these trees, so nice. The rain's holding off as well, which is great and quite unusual for this time of year. All we tend to get is rain, 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 but never mind. I'm getting hair over my <laughs> I think the key with all of these um, IAS, so the international accounting standards, is that you just don't overcomplicate it. They're not going to change, so once you've learned them now, you know, they'll take you all the way through to when you're applying them in real life, in practice. So that's one good thing. It's not as if you're revising them, you do the exam and then you forget all about them. But just remember that IAS, which are the International Accounting Standards, differ to IFRS, which are the International Financial Reporting Standards. It's quite windy up here. Let's see if I can show you some of the scenery. Now, IAS 17 says that one that's categorised as a finance lease is one where substantially all of the, the risks and rewards of ownership are transferred to the owner. But there are other criteria that have to be met for this to be a finance lease. Operating leases are quite easy to account for compared to a finance lease. Now, if a lease meets any of the following criteria, it would be considered as a finance lease. So if the lease transfers ownership of the asset to the leasee by the end of the lease term, if the leasee has the option to purchase the asset at a price that is expected to be sufficiently lower than the fair value at the date the option becomes exercisable so that it is reasonably certain at the inception of the lease that the option will be exercised, then we have lease terms for the major part of the economic life of the asset. And finally, at inception, the present value of the minimum lease payments amounts to at least substantially all of the fair value of the leased asset. If it doesn't meet these criteria, in all likelihood, it's going to be an operating lease. So I hope you've learned something from today. And at the very least, at least you've enjoyed a nice walk. But as always, consider subscribing and I shall see you on the next video.